welcome. Sorry for the little bit of delay. This is normal when we have this many people and some others still to come. So this is our second uh, in our series of eight on, <coughs> excuse me, um, and we welcome everyone to attend whatever meetings they choose. Um, so we're glad to see so many here today. I want to apologize because I realized that I have been working on putting together this series, I think for about six or more months and I didn't realize. And so I've made changes, a few changes over that time. And I forgot to make the changes on the website. So you saw the title for the program a sheet that I gave. This sheet, the information that's on the web, I didn't mean to change uh, uh, or a puzzle for you. And I apologize. It was, I forgot to make them on the website, little details like that. So I'm sorry about that. So the name of the program is Living the Last Chapter of Life with Passion and Purpose. And one of the reasons I made this change is I was so influenced by our speaker from last week who said she thought the most important starting place was with individuals and helping ensure that people were positive and strong and had a sense of themselves. So I, that's the reason I said, ooh, I looked, I read her book and I talked to her and I said, I'm gonna make a change. So this is the change that is. I wanna welcome our speaker who's here today. I was in, in, in the in, in initial meeting with Julie, I was impressed because she's interested in young children and older adults. I thought that was a pretty wide span of interest. Um, and then when I heard her talk about older adults and her sensitivity to their issues and needs, I thought, oh, I wanna get this person here. Then lo and behold, I find out that she's actually trained in a tool that would help address the reason for this meeting today, which as I said, is dealing with individuals and their sense of self. And so this is a, what I would call one of our softer programs. And I appreciate that I found Julie to lead us today. So welcome to Julie Daigle. And as I said, I have to remember the name and myself, living the last chapter of life with passion and purpose. So yeah. Julie, I turn it over to you. All you right. Want me to Thank you. Yeah. you want me to mute everyone right now? Yes, except for me. <laughs> you like me to mute everyone now? Yes. Except for you, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hi, Greg. <laughs> okay. Did I get it? Mute all. I don't know that I got everyone muted. Uh, you, most people can also mute themselves. Right. It looks like you did mute everyone. Okay. okay. But you're, I can hear you. So that's good. Yeah. And <laughs> I think there are a couple more people that are not muted, but I think we're good. Okay. All right, I think everyone will behave themselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you, Judy. Truly, it is an honor uh, for me to be here today. Um, and knowing that this topic is so important and it's one of those conversations in life that um, I'm continually having about living your, your life purpose and your passions. Um, so I have no doubt uh, that I'm in the company of uh, fellow human beings that uh, have lived extraordinary lives. I'm sure all of you are, have lived extraordinary lives and that you've gleaned a lot of wisdom along the way. And so that's why I feel honored to be here today. Um, and hopefully I can add to the pool of wisdom as I share a little bit of my story. All right. Um, and I do believe that, Judy, you mentioned that it was our first guest speaker, and I think you, you called her Libby Boatwright. Um, yep. And um, 
who advocated that today's topic is one of the most important. So I absolutely feel no pressure at all. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This is her book. I'll bring it up. So Judy was kind enough to loan me her book. And so I did get a chance to read it. And it is absolutely phenomenal. Um, It's the last things we talk about by Dr. Elizabeth Boatwright. For those of you who may have not been uh, on the first session. So she asserted that um, as we get older and we face various challenges that we really need to know ourselves. And, um, And that way we're better able to communicate what's really important to us to our friends, to our family members, to our doctors and other people that might be part of our care team. So today, it's my intention to offer you some valuable insights about three different strategies. So initially, I was only going to talk about uh, one strategy called the passion test process that I'm very adept at. But I realized that the other two strategies that Uh, Judy mentioned are very important and actually dovetail into the passion test process. So these are strategies that I've personally used throughout the last 20 or so years. And I've had great success helping people of all ages, as Judy mentioned. Um, I've been teaching in the preschool arena for almost 40 years. And um, And then I've also been working with people at the other end of the spectrum um, with life circumstances that have required them to set up really some pretty unique care plans. Um, And so the three strategies that I'll be talking about today, the first one is called the Conversation Starter Guide. And that was put out by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And if you haven't received this starter kit yet, basically it's a series of questions that you get to answer and that will help you really identify what your needs are and who the people are in your life that you need to talk to, uh, to make sure that your care plan is of a high quality and high vibrational. Um, I have my copy here that Judy gave me. Sorry, I put notes all over it. So at the end of this program, Judy promises to send all of you an attachment with this um, printout. And the starter guide basically, like I said, is a series of questions Um, that you'll answer, take your time answering, and you'll get to know really deep down inside what's important to you. Um, The second strategy is what they call the concentric circles. And that was something that our first guest speaker, Libby, wrote about in her book, The Last Things We Talk About. And again, Judy will be emailing all of you a copy uh, of this. And the third strategy that I'll be presenting is the passion test process. Um, There was a book written years ago by a woman and her ex-husband, Janet and Chris Atwood. And Janet today is considered to be one of the top transformational leaders in the world. And she's a dear friend of mine. And she was highly instrumental in helping me discover what my life purpose was and to help me create a life doing the things that I love. So before we get started with the nuts and bolts of these three strategies, um, would it be okay with you if I shared a little bit about myself and how it is that I came to be your guest speaker today? (laughs) Now, I realize that you've all been muted And you're welcome to do like a little thumbs up like this if you wanna say yes to that. And I'll I'll look for the thumbs up. Um, A portion of this session, uh, at the end of the session, uh, we will allow um, a Q and A where you'll be allowed to unmute yourself. 
and uh, ask your questions or make comments or and so forth, okay? And bear with me, I do have a little script in front of me because I absolutely don't want to miss anything uh, valuable that I feel I wanna share with you today. So as of today, and I say that because as we all know, life changes. Things that we think we can hold on to in one moment can all of a sudden change. And that's absolutely true about who we are and our gifts and talents and life lessons that come our way. So today, who I know myself to be is I consider myself to be a magnificent human being who was born with unique God-given gifts and talents. That's who I know myself to be. My life purpose is to connect with what I love and to create a life that reflects what I'm most passionate about. I currently express my life purpose by teaching, writing, and speaking. I'm a life coach to parents of preschool age children and I'm also a private consultant for seniors who desire to create an in-home care plan. What I love most in life is teaching. Mostly I love helping people, young and old alike, to connect with what they love and create a life that reflects what they're most passionate about. So as within, so without. So you see, I feel really blessed because I believe that I was shown early on in life what I call my life's blueprint. This is like having the ability to actually peek at an invisible treasure map that's inside you. And whenever I do, I get to see some of the hidden gifts and talents that I have. And also sometimes I get to see the life lessons that, I'm, that are waiting for me to learn. And along with having seen my life's blueprint, I've also been blessed with the knowledge of how to actually access it. It's what I call my internal GPS and what some people might call your intuition. And the reason I can say this with confidence today and why I actually speak about this over and over again is because I've been shown time and time again that this is, I have a couple of remarkable stories that I'd like to share with you today uh, that basically highlights what I, this statement. I grew up, I want to tell you basically where I grew up. I grew up in a, a small farming community in Northern Maine. I was one of nine children and my parents decided uh, to place all nine of us in foster care. Wow. I was one of the youngest at 16 months. My foster parents had 11 of their own children. So you can pretty much say that I grew up in a large family. And because of this, with so many children and also my foster parents, I realized that this was significant, that they were actually in their 60s and retired when they decided to take four of my family into their home. And so I believe that my affinity for working with seniors has a lot to do with the fact that I was raised by senior parents. Um, now, growing up in a large family and um, growing up in a farming community where we worked really hard, there was times when, and growing up in foster care, it's very challenging, as you can imagine. And I found myself feeling really unseen and unacknowledged and unloved. 
And I, I remember always walking with this feeling of wanting to just be loved and loved unconditionally. And I remember thinking that everything I did was I was just seeking that love. I was extremely shy. I was reserved and I lacked self-confidence. One of the greatest foundations though that my parents gave me was a strong faith in a higher power. So I grew up going to church every Sunday and that whenever I needed higher guidance or a solution to a problem, that it was, it would benefit me to pray and to ask for God's guidance. So I did. So what happened was, as I was getting close to aging out of the foster care system, I started to feel this like terror inside of me. I was really afraid because I had no idea, you know, what direction my life was going to take. My parents, you know, were un truly uneducated. Uh, neither one of them had finished uh, elementary school. They only spoke French. And so their resources were limited in the sense of guiding me into the outer world. So I did what I had always done when I was afraid. I went to the church by myself and I just asked God for guidance. And it was in that moment that I remember clearly connecting with this like invisible treasure map, if you will, inside of me, I clearly heard, you're going to be a teacher of young children. Well, that made sense to me because, you know, most of my teen years, I had spent babysitting the neighborhood kids. And um, so, and I loved kids. So that felt, that felt right to me to say, to hear, like, I'm going to be a teacher of young children. So I just remember feeling this sense of joy and relief. And I thought, okay, great. And so I remember running home and, um, and then I just got home. And then all of a sudden I thought, you know, I'm just going to listen to some music. And I put my headphones on. And do you guys remember that song, California Dreaming by the Mamas and the Papas? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, that song started to play. And as I was listening to the words, I remember this picture starting to form in my mind. And I saw myself walking somewhere in California where I had never been before. And there was this woman with dark hair walking beside me. And then I saw myself teaching children in a school. And so it was as if like I, I was watching a movie of some sort. Well, and then that just kind of faded. And then I, I was started thinking about it. And I thought, well, with the lack of soul confidence that I had and growing up in foster care, and I knew absolutely no one in California, uh, I really doubted that any of this was going to happen. What I was confident about was my ability to go to college. So I had been given... Uh, through the state of Maine, a four-year scholarship to continue my education. So I went ahead and applied uh, to college, and I was accepted at one of the top uh, New England universities, and I majored in early childhood education. Well, during my second year at university, I became best friends with a woman who had dark hair. And during our senior year, I remember her asking me what I was planning to do after graduation. Well, I realized that nowhere had I really thought about this movie that, or this vision or whatever you want to call it, that had, that had sparked my imagination back when I was 17. But when she asked that question, all of a sudden, it was as if it, somebody just turned it on again, and I saw myself, and something, it, I don't remember, something just said, I'm going to California. 
I remember <laughs> like listening, like who just said that? And then, so she asked me, she said, well, do you know anybody in California? And I said, no. And she said, well, I have a sister in San Diego and I have a brother in Vallejo. And she said, I'll go with you to California. So it gets even better. So I was pretty excited. I thought, that's awesome. So we'll save our money and we'll fly out to California. And she had asked me my preference. Did I want to go to San Diego? Did I want to go to Vallejo? And then I thought, well, I don't really, I didn't know because I'd never been there. And so a few weeks later, a woman from San Francisco moves to the University of Maine that we were at. And starts working at the financial aid office where my friend was working. And when she found out that we were planning to go to California, she said, do you have a job waiting for you? And my best friend was like, no, we're just going to look for teaching positions when we get there. And she said, well, the job that I just left in downtown San Francisco is available. How about I interview you here? And then I'll hire you. And when you get to California, you can just step right into my position. And so my friend said, okay. And so she interviewed her and gave her the job. So now we knew where to move to. So she called, my best friend called her brother in Vallejo and asked him if we could stay with him while we got started. And he said, yes. And so now, great. We had a place to live and she had a job waiting for her. A few weeks later, a phone call comes in to my best friend once again, and it's her sister who's in the military stationed in Massachusetts. And they, her and her husband had just gotten orders to go to Korea. Well, when they found out that we were going to California, they asked us, would we mind driving their car cross country and dropping the car off to Washington State, where he was from, and then we could just fly back down to San Francisco. This was un unbelievable. Everything, all the pieces were coming together for us. We had a place to live, a job, and now a car to drive cross country. I mean, it was amazing. So let me just kind of flip over here to the next page. So all of that all that was left for me was really was to find a teaching position. So we moved to, we moved in with our brother in Vallejo and I started looking at the local newspapers for a teaching position. Within three weeks after moving to Vallejo, I saw an ad in the paper for a teaching position in a private preschool, one block from the house where we were living. I applied and I was hired. And that started my career as a Montessori preschool teacher in 1983. So by the year 2000, I was 39 years old at that point in time. I was co-owner of two of the top preschools, private preschools in the Bay Area. Pretty remarkable, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So, well, even with all of that evidence that came my way and all those synchronicities, I still wasn't fully getting it, that I was walking around with some sort of treasure map inside me and that I had the ability to access it. What I was really good at, though, was experiencing fear <laughs> and then seeking higher guidance through my prayer, you know, and going to church and asking God for guidance. So it took me, I'd say, about another decade uh, to realize that there was some sort of blueprint inside of me and that when we're open to it, it'll show us our greatest treasures, knowing who we truly are and what and why we're here. So which leads me back to answering the question, how is it that I came to be your guest speaker today? and specifically talking about this topic. Well, after living out that part of my blueprint of me moving from Maine to California, 
becoming a preschool teacher and having my own private preschools, my life as I knew it completely changed. I thought that was the end, that I was going to continue having these schools and this was going to be the, you know, my journey, my career for the rest of my life. Well, a series of events occurred. And at the time I had gotten married and I had been married for 10 years and both my marriage and my teaching career completely collapsed around me. I was devastated. Here I was about 40 years old and I once again felt really lost <laughs> and I felt like, like here I was starting life all over again. And I began seriously doubting that I had really tuned into my life purpose after all. I kept wondering like, where had I gone wrong? Had I taken a wrong turn? Had I missed a, a sign somewhere? And so looking back on it now, I'm aware the truth is that I was really not that happy in my marriage after all. And I had started to kind of get antsy in my teaching career. And yeah, it took a few months for me to kind of let go of that feeling of being disappointed and somehow that I'd failed myself. So I, I once again did what I, I'm really good at. And I started to ask for clues, like give me clues to my next adventure. Okay. So before I knew it, I found myself living in Arnold in the foothills of the Sierras. And it was there that I met a new life partner and I began discovering a completely new aspect of myself. And it was while in this relationship that I became a healthcare advocate for a man who had Parkinson's. Norman Ainsworth he is dearly departed now, and he became one of my greatest teachers. He helped me to see some of my greatest strengths and qualities. As I cared for him at home, I began to care for myself in ways that I'd never done before. For eight years, I immersed myself in learning about practically every aspect of caring for a loved one at home and how to effectively navigate the healthcare system. And if, if, and I know that you all have wisdom around that. So unbeknownst to me though, is I was actually being guided to learn the strategy of the conversation project and how to set up the one's concentric circles. I'd never been introduced to that, but somehow I knew intuitively that it needed to be done. It was a huge learning curve for me. While caring for him, I also was working in the mortgage industry. This was in 2008, just as the mortgage crisis hit. And it was at this exact moment that the passion test process presented itself to me, the book by, Je by Janet Atwood. I remember I was sitting at my desk in the mortgage office with my boss sitting across from me. He was the, uh, the, um, the mortgage broker. And I looked at him and I said, Jay, it looks like we may be losing our jobs. And uh, I said, I feel like now might be a good time for me to do another shift in my uh, career. And I said, I have no idea what direction I want to take. So he said, hold that thought. And he got up, he went to his office and he came out and he handed me the passion test book by Janet Atwood. And he said, read this. It's going to help you figure out what direction to take. So I read it and I wrote down 
my top three passions, because in the book, it kind of guides you through the process. My number one passion in 2008, this was 13 years ago, was to be of higher service to thousands of people by helping them discover and live out their top passions. My number two passion was to be a motivational speaker. And my number three passion was to become a New York Times bestseller. Well, here I was living in this tiny little city, town up in Arnold, 4,000 people, really remote, with little means of making a huge impact. And I really felt unsure of how I was gonna accomplish these goals. They seemed so far-fetched to me. And I remember looking at this and going like, I again, this is like dreaming. And I remember in the book, Janet Atwood's advice was that once you identify your top passions, that you then focus on them every day and not worry about it. Let go and let God. So I knew I was good at that. So as you know, the mortgage crisis was in full swing. And the city that I worked in, Angel's Camp, was feeling, really feeling the crunch of it because they had literally designed their city plan around real estate. And all the people that worked in Angel's Camp were in the trades. Well, the city council decided that they that it might be benefit them to put on what they called an economic development forum. And they invited everyone from Angel's Camp or the surrounding area, basically Calaveras County, to attend this forum and to basically give ideas on how the city should move forward. And so this was not something that I was particularly interested in but I kept getting this nudging feeling like I was supposed to go to this. So I did. Well, I'm sitting in the auditorium. There's about 150 people there. And all of a sudden, I remember seeing a couple of rows ahead of me. There was this man and this woman sitting there together. And all I could see was them. I like all of a sudden everything just tuned out except these two people. It was like there was a spotlight on them. And I was getting this message that I should go talk to them. I should connect with them. So during intermission, I followed the woman to the bathroom and I waited until she came out. <laughs> and when she came out, I said, um, what are you? Uh, she said, I, I introduced myself and I said, hi, my name's Julie uh, and I'd like to have a conversation with you. <laughs> and so she looked at me and she said, okay. She said, uh, what would you like to talk about? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I literally said that to her. I have no idea. I said, all I know is I'm supposed to connect with you. So she must have thought I was a nutcase or something, but surprisingly <laughs> enough, she was intrigued enough. And she said to me, okay, well, why don't we meet tomorrow uh, in this community garden that's up the hill towards Arnold? And I said, okay, that I would meet her there. So the next day I'm in my car driving and I'm thinking to myself, I have still don't have any idea what I'm supposed to talk to this woman about. And she's gonna think I'm an idiot. And so I finally show up and we're just kind of strolling through the garden. You know, it's this big, it's a mountain ranch gardens, beautiful community garden. And this young couple was growing the food literally for the people in Calaveras County. And I'm talking to her and all of a sudden I just said to her, well, tell me about yourself. Who are you and uh, what, what are you involved in? And she said, well, I'm Karen Lubin. And she said, I'm the director of the Passion Test Training Program. I, she said, I'm Janet Atwood's right-hand person. 
and I hadn't told her that I'd read the book. I, all of a sudden, I just like, what? You're what? You're who? And she said, I'm Karen Lubin, and I'm Janet Atwood's right-hand person, the woman who wrote the passion test process. And so I said, oh, my God, I just read that book, literally read that book. I'd never heard of it before. And I said, well, where do you live? And she said, about a mile from here. So this whole time, the Janet Atwood's right-hand person was living a mile from me. And so it was clear to me that I was, again, being given clues to the direction that my life was about to take. So. The reason I'm here today, one of the reasons I'm here today is because I am a certified passion test facilitator. I am one of 3,000 worldwide who is trained, who is personally trained by Janet and Chris Atwood. And for the past 11 years, I've been helping hundreds of people, children, young adults, adults, and seniors discover and live out their top passions. Mm. Pretty cool, huh? Mm. And there was no mistake here. I mean, er everything was like, it was like, God was like, hello, you know, <laughs> there's something pretty cool about life here. And uh, he was showing me uh, that inside me and others, we have uh, this beautiful blueprint that we can access. And so to this day, for the last 11 years, I've had the opportunity to speak nationally and internationally as a motivational speaker. My favorite audiences, I must confess, are the preschoolers. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun. And also, I really do enjoy um, speaking to seniors who um, are trying, who are, who, who desire to stay in their home for the rest of their lives, if possible. And especially those who have some sort of life-threatening diagnosis. So I'm currently writing a book uh, that I hope one day will help people discover their life purpose so that they can see how remarkable life is. So, dear friends, I, I truly believe that there's no accident that we're here together on this day, at this time, having this conversation. I believe it was part of my blueprint to be here and for you too. So, see. And it was just recently that I literally was using, before I met Judy at the coffee shop, I was literally just using the words, the last chapter of my life. I was just talking to people uh, about that because I've been feeling like I'm moving into the last chapters of my life. Now, everybody knows that depending on what book you're reading, those chapters could have two, those last chapters could have 200 pages or they could have five pages, right? We don't know. <laughs> I hope mine has 200 pages. So all I know is that it's really important at this time um, that throughout these years of working with people of all ages, that having uh, those heartfelt conversations is critical and really important. So, I understand her. Me too. Yeah. So, my job, as you can imagine, my job in the mortgage industry went bye bye. By 2009, I was gainfully unemployed and looking for a new job. I thought that by becoming a passion test facilitator, uh, that I could get right back into the teaching arena and start using that new tool. Well, there were other plans in store for me and I, that I had no idea were coming. Um, after losing my job in Angel's Camp, I was looking for a new job and I moved back to Benicia. 
and thinking that this was a good community. I loved it here. I felt comfortable. And then as I, and I was looking for a job. Well, a friend of mine, a longtime friend of mine had no clue that I was unemployed and that I had moved to Benicia. But she had received an email from another friend who was looking for a living caregiver. And so the, and so she just forwarded it to a bunch of people and I happened to get it at the exact time when I was looking for a job. And the ad read, help for ocean. And I thought, help for ocean? And I knew that my friend was like into dolphins and things like that. So I thought maybe she was looking for donations for the dolphins, but no, I was reading the, the, the email and it was from a woman in Santa Rosa whose best friend had just had a massive stroke. She was 61 years old. She was in critical care um, at, at Marin County or actually UCSF. And uh, they didn't know if she was gonna make it. But if she did make it, um, she knew that she wanted her best friend to be cared for in her home, like her, her home, and that she needed somebody to come in and, and take care of her. Well, I had never done that. Not, I mean, I had taken care of Norman who had Parkinson's, but I'd never taken care of anybody with a stroke. So I responded to the ad, you're gonna love this piece. So <laughs> her name was Trish. So I'm responding to Trish who want, who's looking to hire the caregiver. And all of a sudden I re I get a return email, but it's not from Trish. It's from a woman that who used to be a parent of mine 17 years prior in the preschool. Her daughter, I was her daughter's first preschool teacher in Berkeley. And when she saw my name, she said to her friend Trish, she says, Julie Daigle, you got to hire her. She was my child's first preschool teacher. She's awesome. And so I got hired. So off to Santa Rosa, I went and started working with this woman who'd had a stroke. No coincidences, right? So mm -hmm. for the past 11 years, I've worked as a primary caregiver and healthcare advocate for people with cancer, people recovering from a stroke, people who have been diagnosed with all forms of dementia, like Alzheimer's. I've worked with people with Parkinson's. And I use the passion test process with all of my clients to help set up an ideal in-home care plan. What I discovered is that the passion test is a fun way, an effective way that leads one into naturally having those end of life conversations that so many of us don't wanna have. When my clients are able to first focus on what they love, then the rest of the story just falls into place with ease and grace. I like that. I'm also a poet, by the way. <laughs> I was shown that even with life debilitating health issues, a person can still have a strong desire and ability to express their passions. A case in point is a past client of mine who is uh, recently deceased, you may know who he is. His name is Donald Green. And he was one of the founders of the Green Music Center uh, in Santa Rosa. Well, my life path took me to him. I was hired as a consultant to help him figure out a way to write his memoir. At the time I met Don, he was 82 years old and he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And his wife was 83 years old and she'd been diagnosed with mid-stage Alzheimer's. And they had set up an in-home care plan 
with seven around the clock caregivers. They were pretty wealthy and could, you know, had been able to do that. But much to their dismay, there was so much dissension amongst the, the care team that Don found himself unable to focus on writing his book. Most of his time was spent trying to resolve the issues among the staff and within his family while dealing with his, his condition. So when I came in, I applied within a four month period of time, I applied the conversation project, my own version of it. I set up his con concentric circles and I did the passion test process with him. And Don was able to write his memoirs. Unbeknown and so here is his book that he wrote, Defining Moments. Talk about amazing stories. Love it. And this is an autographed copy that I received from Don prior to his death last year. So again, this is another example of a success story using the passion test process, the conversation project, and the concentric circles. Another person who highly, who came upon, who like appeared on my blueprint, my life blueprint, is a woman that I call Helen of Joy. This is the third Helen I was talking about. Helen was one of my greatest teachers, and she has also uh, died and is now looking down upon me. I can feel her with me all the time. She helped me to see some of my greatest abilities, which are to be compassion in action and to love myself and others unconditionally. You see, she was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at age 58. Both she and her life partner were in, both in the healthcare industry. Helen was a physical therapist and Sandra was a midwife. Upon receiving the diagnosis, Helen had requested from her partner that she be cared for at home and never placed in assisted living. And of course, Sandra promised to fulfill those wishes. By the time I was referred to them, it had been maybe two or three years into the diagnosis, Helen had had six different caregivers and none of them were able to work with her, including her life partner, who thought that she could have. She had quit her job as a midwife and stayed home with Helen to take care of her. But Helen had gotten extremely violent and unmanageable. Her life partner was at her wit's end and the stress level was off the charts. I was referred to Helen and Sandra and again, had never really dealt with any form of Alzheimer's or dementia. Within a month of caring for Helen as her primary caregiver, I applied the conversation project. I set up the concentric circles and I did the passion test process with both Helen and Sandra. The home environment went from this high level of chaos to calm. Helen and Sandra's daily care plan revolved around living out their passions versus constantly worrying about the health condition. Instead of resisting life, which is what Helen was doing when I first started working with her. She didn't want to get up in the morning. She, she didn't want to get dressed. She just was not, she was not a happy camper and she was pretty violent. She'd throw things at people. Helen started waking up most days with a sense of purpose and joy as I reminded her of the things she loved to do and the people that she loved to spend time with. Uh, in doing the passion test process with Helen, 
I, we discovered that Helen loved listening to music. She loved dancing. She loved shopping for clothes, especially hats. She loved going out to restaurants and eating. And most importantly, she had had a huge social uh, circle of friends and family. And she loved spending time with her friends and family. These were the things that she focused on prior to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. But with Helen's behavior being so volatile, many of the, her friends and family stopped visiting and calling because they were unsure of how to help or how to interact with her at this point in time. So as Helen's caregiver, I reached out to all of her friends and to her family after I did the passion test process with her and, um, and shared with them what her top five passions were and how we were on a daily basis living these out. Well, you can imagine they were totally relieved and excited and they wanted to know how they could now participate in Helen's top passions. So a monthly social calendar was set up and all of her closest friends and family members once again were integrated back into their lives. So about three months after being with Helen, I was asked to take her to see her neurologist at UCSF. The geriatric nurse and the neurologist hadn't seen Helen for a year. They were blown away about how different and better she seemed. They were perplexed and delighted at the same time. Wasn't she supposed to be getting worse with the diagnosis? But what they were noticing is that she was actually getting better. <laughs> so, so when I shared Helen's new daily care plan with her neurologist and, and how uh, she was focused on what she loved, the neurologist thought it was brilliant. And he asked me to send his staff the blueprint stating that all of his, oh, saying that all of his patients could benefit from this. So the primary reason that I think Helen and Sandra's lives had become so unmanageable was because they were no longer doing the things they loved. They had forgotten to focus on what's most important in life, who we truly are. We're magnificent human beings with God-given gifts and that are just waiting to be discovered and fully expressed throughout our entire life, no matter what the circumstances are. So, dear friends, I'm here today to invite each one of you to take the time to begin using these three important strategies. Before I begin teaching you the, and showing you the passion test process, which is a very simple process, by the way, I would like for us to just maybe take a break and, wow, is it 2.30 already? Wow. Um, mm. And maybe stretch a little bit and then maybe take five minutes. Is that okay, Judy? Yeah. Okay. Maybe take five minutes, stretch, go to the bathroom, do what you need to do. And everyone will need, if you don't have one, a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. Okay. Yeah. We'll see you in five. How you doing, Judy? Gosh, I'm ready and waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Okay, yeah. good. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm I'm ready. Good. I'm totally curious. Yes. Uh -huh. I'm actually working on, I, I've been thinking, so what are my top three passions? Exactly. Uh -huh. And I would imagine that most of you know what they are because, you know, I can't imagine that anyone on this call wouldn't have already been yeah. thinking about this or living out their passions already. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes they're just not brought to the surface. Correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. I've got to put myself on hold. I've got to take Charlie down to have his hair cut. So oh. <laughs> I'll just put myself on hold and come when I get come back. I'll just okay. Back on, all right? okay, okay, Helen. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you got to do I, what you got to do. Uh, yeah, I can't. Uh, I'm afraid Charlie I'm, is her dog. Yeah, the dog. sorry, he's a dog. <laughs> I love. I love dogs. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Oh, look at that great picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charlie brings a lot of happiness to a lot of people. Does he yeah. or she? Is it a she or a he? I think it's a he. Janice, I don't know. Charlie is a he, yes. Charlie is a he. Okay. Yeah, here, here's, here's my love. Oh, hello, love. Oh, Samantha. Samantha? Uh-huh. Oh, hi, Samantha. <laughs> I love it when people bring their animals on Zoom. It's so cute. <laughs> you know, she loves Zoom. She sits with me through all these classes. <laughs> uh, she's learning so much. She's like, she's probably thinking, oh, I'm so glad mom's taking this class. I really enjoy this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> Actually, I think my cat keeps butting into my class. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little more attention. <laughs> Where is your cat? Well, he, she she was on my lap, but she's gone away now. She decided okay. I, I can. Oh, well, that's because she heard there was a five minute break. Yeah, so she's like, all right, <laughs> I'm gonna go stretch. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, there's somebody's cat. Oh, where? Okay. Oh, look at that kitty. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. <laughs> Molly, you ought to hold up one of yours. Oh, yes. Show us your kitties. We love the cats. Dogs. Well, Molly's are, are really quite exceptional. Yes. They're stars. They're yes, stars. they are. Yes, they are. They <laughs> come in with just unconditional love. They're here to teach us that. Sure, to spark it in us. Yeah. Oh. Loa has two beautiful black kitties. Uh huh. Look oh. at these. Look at these guys. Let oh my. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, look at them. Oh, I can't see them. Oh, they were oh, so man. cute. So cute. Down. <laughs> Come here. Okay. Yeah, we probably need to get back. Yeah. All right. I'm sure everyone's kind of moseying their way back. Yeah. Good. Some people have their. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just thought it'd be good to just kind of stretch a little bit. And I did my walk. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. Is everybody ready? Yeah. Okay. Judy's yeah. ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one of the things that I love to do whenever I'm ready to do the passion test process or go into this kind of teaching mode is I love to light a candle. And so it's a heart-shaped candle. And I will light it for all of us today. All right. Okay. Everybody has a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, preferably mm -hmm. a pencil. Um, okay. So before I begin the exercise, I really want to point out 
that the strategies that I use are perfect for me and my life blueprint. You are all unique onto yourselves and you have within you specific tools and strategies that you probably have already been using most of your life. And you can add these new ones to it or continue to use the strategies that you feel have been working for you. So like for me, I, I grew up going to church and praying and asking God for guidance. And that worked for me because then I somehow am able to clearly hear uh, this higher guidance. But you might be somebody who gets aha moments when you're walking out in nature or Perhaps, um, you know, one of the things my foster mother was really good at, and I think is where she gleamed most of her <laughs> aha moments was she loved to knit and she could knit and crochet for hours at a time. And I'm sure that that was a time when she was quiet and peaceful and in herself and probably got a lot of the wisdom about her life through those modes. So keep that in mind. These are strategies that we're bringing to you, the conversation project, the concentric circles, or, and uh, the passion test process. So you can try them out. If it feels good, great. Keep going with it. If not, there's something else that's available for you. And you just need to ask, and it will show up on your path, okay? All right. And also, I also want to say that while I, we're taking you through the process, you may uh, or may not have your passions or what you love pop right up into your mind right away. And that's okay. Because like I said, we're having, we're opening the portal to the conversation right now. And what usually happens is when we open the door, then it might be that we have to journey down the path a little bit before something pops up at us. Okay. okay. So just trust that process. So if okay. you don't get anything today, don't worry about it. Don't think like, oh God, I can't get, no, no, it's there. It's happening. And it will happen in your divine timing. Okay? Okay. All right. Um, all right. So the first thing that I'm going to do um, is I'm going to take those of you who wish to participate on a wonderful journey to a time when you felt a great sense of joy. So this is an invitation. It's not you have to do this. But basically, I lit a candle, and I just want everybody to just kind of get into a comfortable position, wherever you are. Adjust your chair. If you need to get up off your chair and go lay down somewhere and just kind of get comfortable, you can do that, just as long as you can hear my voice, okay? So now that every, and I'm going to get myself into a comfortable position. And just so you know, I never know what's going to come. Just basically going to take us on a sort of guided meditation and then trust that whatever information is going to come through for all is, is for all of us and that it pertains to you and to your unique blueprint that is right inside of you, has been active all your life from the day that you were born and is still available and offering clues to the next part of your journey. Okay. So I ask everybody to just close their eyes for a minute and take a deep breath in and out. Take another deep breath in and out. Take 
And one more. And I want you to picture, if you can, a road in front of you, standing on a road. It can be any kind of surface that you want it to be. And you're looking down at your feet. And as you're looking at your feet, you're noticing that the road that you're on. And it feels like you want to take some steps forward on this road. And so you look up and ahead of you and you see something. You see something that is inviting you to come forward. And as you see this something that's, that's inviting you, 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 you notice that you're feeling kind of excited about it. There's something that is, you're not quite sure. Maybe you don't have a clear vision of it yet, but there's something that's inviting you to come forward and to explore. And so you begin to start slowly walking in that direction of this something that's bringing up this feeling of joy. And as you get closer to it, you notice that it's, and now I invite you to open your eyes and immediately write down what you saw. Don't hesitate, don't think about it, just write it down. So that, how many of you from a thumbs up saw something? Okay, thumbs up, good, okay, excellent, okay, good, all right. So this was just a very, uh, an exercise and just knowing that whenever we want to connect with our internal blueprint, we must first be in a relaxed state, okay? I noticed that for me in the very beginning of my life, for decades, fear seemed to be the motivator for me to move away from fear and into what I loved. Then I learned new strategies, which is like this, just sitting back, relaxing, and just allowing my breath to take me on a journey. And I imagine that most of you have put into play already some sort of maybe meditation uh, technique or relaxation technique in your lives. Okay. And so whatever works for you, take yourself there. Allow yourself to sit in silence, or maybe you're listening to music, or sometimes when I'm in the car, I'm just driving and all of a sudden, poof, this amazing idea comes through. Okay. And begin to capture it. All right. So now what we're going to do is I want you to number, I want you to put a number one on your paper. Well, actually, wait, before you do the number one, I want you to write the words, when my life is ideal, I am dot, dot, dot. When my life is ideal, I am dot, dot, dot. And then put a number one underneath that. And this number one, there's going to be three of them and I'll, I'll guide you through this. Number one is going to be your first intention, which is when my life is ideal, I am. You notice the I am statement mean, is putting you in a position of actually living it in the now. You're not wanting, you're not wishing, you're actually experiencing it now. 
noticed when I wrote passion number one, I am impacting thousands of people and teaching them. I am a motivational speaker. I am, right? So you are basically instructing your blueprint inside of you to, to, to give you the clues towards this intention and how it's going to manifest. So your first intention will be something that you feel you really desire to be experiencing. So is anybody in the group right now who has some idea of what that number one passion or number one intention might be? Mm -hmm. Who would like to share? Don't be shy. I'm not sure I followed your instructions directly. Okay. I didn't come up with things I wanted to do. Okay, what did you write? I wrote, I wanted to be calm. Yes. Productive and kind. Perfect. Okay, now is that one intention or are those three separate ones? Three. Perfect. Okay, so let's go with the first one. Um, when my life is ideal, I am calm, all right? So write it in the positive and as if it's already happening. Now, under the I am calm, you're going to put a letter A, B, and C. Everyone should do that. A, B, and C. Where? Now, Where that? Okay. Under the number one, you're going to put A, B, and C. Under the number two, you're going to put A, B, and C. And under number three, you're going to put A, B, and C. And I'll tell you why. So the one is your intention. I am calm. Now, and I'm sorry, who was it that was that was speaking? Gail. Gail. Hi, Gail. Thank you. Gail. So Gail, um, now the ABC, what you're going to write down are concrete, tangible things that will prove to you that you are calm. So for instance, you could write something like, I sit and have tea at two o'clock in, uh, in the afternoon. In the morning would work. <laughs> in the morning, okay. Put it <laughs> I sit and have tea at 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm writing in my journal on a daily basis. These are tangible things that you can actually, you know, when you read it, you're like, yeah, I know I'm calm because look what I'm actually doing. So those are called markers. The ABCs are your markers and the one, two, threes are your intentions. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, pretty simple, right? All right. So begin to to identify, take time to sit and just kind of ponder or maybe go, like I said, go, go sit by the ocean or be out in nature and begin to just ask your inner blueprint, show me what it is that I'm most passionate about. What do I care about? What is it that matters to me at this moment in time? Not 10 years ago when I was, you know, doing la la la, right now, in this moment, what matters to me? And, and, and whenever, and see what we tend to do, what people tend to do is the idea will come up and then we, we add the, but I can't have that because la 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 la, so-and-so won't allow me, or I don't live la la la. So as soon as you hear the, but take the, but and throw it out. Okay, literally just take that butt and throw it out the window. All right. Allow allow that that desire to just surface, write it down, and you may not believe it at first. And I've you I've shared my story of how many times I didn't believe it, you know, because it seemed incredulous to me, but you saw 
how time after time it was revealed to me that anything is possible and that everything we need to accomplish those intentions will be given to us. And it's just our job to believe that it's going to happen and to pay attention to the clues that are revealed to us. All right. Okay. So everyone should have their three, you know, that just numbered one, two, and three. You don't have to know what the intentions are yet, but you know the format. Okay. Now, once you have identified all three passions or intentions, I should say, and then listed your markers, then what you can do is get a three by five index card and transfer the one, two, three ABCs onto your three by five index card. And then you're going to take that index card and you're going to place it someplace in your world where you know you're going to look at it every morning and every night before you go to sleep. Okay? Every morning upon waking. And then, so usually when I started this process years ago, I put, I had several of them actually. I'm an A type personality. So I was like, I had multiple cards placed in multiple locations so that I couldn't miss them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so get creative and then so put it somewhere where you know you can look at it every day and then trust that over time and again it's different for each of you over time you're going to see things incrementally shifting in your world and I'll give you a prime example just today my blueprint delivered uh, a clue to me. And Judy, you'll know this because I was taking my walk around the marina and who should all of a sudden, um, oh my gosh, I'm trying, Lisa, that is part of your book club. Lisa was walking out, out off her boat and she was literally a good 10 feet in, ahead of me. And all of a sudden she just turned and she looked at me and she said, um, like she needed to connect with me. Like we, we'd we never had, not really had a conversation. And all of a sudden we we're having this conversation and she's inviting me to participate with her in this new project that she's super excited about. And she's like, would you be interested in this? And I said, yes. <laughs> so you see, it just appears on your path. The opportunities show up over and over again, and whether or not we say yes will determine the direction of our lives, okay? All right, so then put it on your three by five card, and then at the very bottom, I want you to write these words. Whatever you focus on grows. Mm -hmm. So we can either focus on what we fear the most or we can focus on what we love the most. We get to choose. And that dear one ends my art in this series. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So I do want to leave it for uh, if there are any questions, comments, feedback, I welcome it all. Yeah. So Julie, it seems to me, and let me check this out. One of the keys to this process is the phrase, when my life is ideal, I am. Yes. That's where I would come up with the three passions. The three exactly. passions or intentions. Yep. Or intentions. Yep. And then below those, I would have put the markers. Correct. Those are highly specific. Yes. Okay. It's the evidence that you are actually living out that passion. Okay. All right. 
Okay. And one of the I got things it. that uh, you might want it, you might want her to do is clean the cabinet faces. So um the cabinet. Are there any questions? Yeah, but not now. Well, okay. well thought of it. <laughs> are we getting some some background? We're getting some feedback. Somebody had a question that they're asking their Molly? partner. Yeah. Can you okay, question. Susan, did you have a question? I actually had a comment. Um, Great. When you started out talking about finding your life path. I realized that just before I didn't know what the topic was going to be today, as Judy said, because it got, you know, wasn't accurately yeah. on our calendar. So I wasn't really sure what I was coming to, but I had just read an article uh, about synchronicity in your life and um, <laughs> how and how to awaken your brain to those opportunities. And uh, somebody who wrote another book called The Awakened Brain by Lisa Miller. And so if this isn't a synchronicity, right, that I was just reading about that, and then, you know, 10 minutes later, I come to the session, so. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And, and the exciting thing, Susan, that I'm discovering is that the, the synchronicities are now happening quicker and quicker, literally. I mean, just Boom, boom, boom. I, I can't make it up. I'm just like, I, I wake up every day, like not knowing what's going to happen, but super excited because I know something good's going to happen. Okay, somebody else? Janice. I just love your approach. Aww, it's just, just uh, you know, it's just so exciting listening to you talk about it. Good. This Thank you. Energy. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You've been a great, great participant. And and like I said, it's not an accident Gail, that each sharing. one of you is here. Uh, Gail, did you have a question, Gail? <laughs> okay. No, I was thanking her for sharing. Oh, okay, Gail. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm sure you have some juicy questions. <laughs> what is it that you're going to be sending us by email, Judy? Do you oh, I'm going to be sending. Um, there's something called the Conversation Project, which is helping you. To, like I sat and did the project with my youngest daughter, and I was really communicating um, some wishes for my end of life, mm -hmm. and it was then I. I sent them to my other kids after Pam and I finished that. So it's a, it, it is what it says, a conversation project. Um, the second thing is something called the concentric circle. Um, what do I want to say? Uh, concentric circle strategy. And it's very, I've never experienced this before. It's in um, Libby's book. And she talks about looking at people in our life and, Maybe some people would be great caretakers and other people not, but those people might bring some fun or joy into our life. So we look at the concentric circles and we say, I'm going to be needing caretaking. I want to have someone give me kind of a joyous experience. And we put people in, I might say, oh, I really like the way Mimi uh, talks to people and really connect. So I'm going to put Mimi down in that circle of someone who connects well with me. Um, and so we're, I'm going to uh, send you both of those things. That isn't a very good explanation. Sorry about that. I'll take a little something up. I, I will, I will wait with bated breath. With bated breath. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll include an explanation with it. Okay. <laughs> I really don't know what bated breath is. <laughs> oh. Oh. What is bated breath? What is bated oh, breath? Anyway? Well, about it, and bated can oh, mean like it's got a, a lure that's waiting for somebody to bite into. Oh, maybe that's but it. It, also it has to do be, with fish. And, and, <laughs> or it also could be like uh, a bait, you know, like, um, you know how something is, a, is an, in abatement or oh. ending? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I, that's I think, a good one. Thank you. I think Mimi. that's where it is. 
No kidding. Oh well, you know, I put, I was using my, I was testing my concentric circle of support actually before I got on the call. Something told me to call. Remember the dark haired woman that came out to California with me? Yeah. yeah. Well, guess what? She still lives here in Benicia with me. And we are, uh, we're still 40 years of friendship Good. from college. And she lives a mile mm. from me and she now has five grandchildren that are now my grandchildren. <laughs> I adopted them. <laughs> um, and so I put a little test to her and I gave her, I called her out of the blue this afternoon when I don't normally call her. She knows I'm usually at work. She's at work. And she picked up and she goes, um, like, I, I noticed that you're calling me at a time when I'm at work and you're usually at work, but I, I picked up and see that's your 2 a.m. person. That's the second circle of support, you see, because that's the person that you want, no matter what time it is, they'll pick up the phone and say, are you OK? Right. So that's part of the concentric circle is figuring out who are those people? Who can I trust that no matter what, they're going to help me with my finances or they're, they're going to, I can tell them anything and they will not betray my trust. Or, you know, these are all your people that you've collected over the years that they've like, they're in your circle of people. And, but now you're going to start thinking about them and you're going to be like, all right, so if I had to go shopping for, you know, clothes or something that, uh, who is that person? And who would if I, I have to go me? visit my doctor, who, and I want to take somebody, who's that, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are the things that, you know, we kind of like take for granted. Um, and then when the time, when a crisis hits, that's when you don't want to be thinking about it. You just want to know who these people are. Okay. People do okay. offer us different things. Yes. So anyway. mm -hmm. Okay. With bated breath. With bated <laughs> breath. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I think we're beyond our time. So I, I don't know we are. All next, right. Well, you guys. next week, next week, it's Alan Fluchok, our favorite doc. Good. Who's, who's going to talk about what happens when you get a diagnosis and how you can handle it and how you can talk with the docs and um he's uh he's done something similar before what a pleasure good uh, so and that's our next week yeah and he's my neighbor he literally lives across the street from oh, me oh that's right <laughs> yeah right no accident there thank you julie uh, i'm gonna thank you my, my three passions love you, love guys. you later